Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where we're having another news day, having a look at all of the changes that have gone into the Data Rig platform throughout November 2021. And there's a few different interesting things happening. There's a new runtime we need to take a look at in 10.1. And yeah, we'll talk about some interesting stuff. There's a few changes to how files and repos and some of the stuff we we're talking about in the last video works. There's some interesting new streaming things we can do. One of which is actually a really nice big change that we're probably going to implement in a lot of the ways that we work. So yeah, loads of interesting stuff, loads of things we can dig into. Should all be good. Um, if it's your first time around here, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Hang around. Tons and tons of videos, lots of things to do. And I will drop a little link to the release notes down in the descriptions below so you can go and have a look yourself. Don't take my word for it. Go read the documentation, go read the stuff, and then we'll all be good. Okay, so... Let's go and have a look what's changed. Okay, so as always, I'm in the Azure version of the Dataworks release notes. They are very similar this month in terms of things across the th different three platforms. Um, but I do most of our stuff in Azure these days. So I'm going to scroll right down to the bottom so we can go in chronological order. And first things first, we have files and repos in the web terminal. So if you're using a Dataworks cluster, once it's actually spun up, you can log into the web terminal. And we've used it in one video before, I think, when we're doing hive scanning, um, doing some jiggery pokery to work out how Databricks is actually talking to the underlying Metastore. So if you want to be able to run shell commands, if you want to be able to essentially open up a terminal command directly to the driver, uh, you can do that. So we can now, through that web terminal, access files that are held in our files and repos commands. So if you pulled in a shell script and you've been playing around with it in your repo and you want to access that shell script or run that shell script directly from the web terminal, you can now do that and you have a reference path to go and look at it. So interesting new one, fairly niche in terms of the way things are doing. If you've got masses and masses of shell scripts, it could be a nice, interesting thing you could look at. Uh, next one is default languages. Now, this is one that kind of caught me out because I was demoing some things to a client and I opened and went, are that, that button's new, where'd that come from? Um, it's a real simple thing. So I've just got a little, a little data frame open here. And you can see we've now got this big chunky button telling us what language each cell is. And we didn't have that before. So you used to have a little drop down at the top that said, what is the primary language of my Databricks notebook? And then each cell was just assumed to be that primary language, unless it deliberately had something at the top saying, well, actually, this is Markdown. And you can see that's now updated. So that's figured out what that magic command is. And that's all that doing. It's just showing the the current context. So I can tell it, I can switch it around. I can use this to control the language of it. And that'll just change that magic command right at the top to control what the language of that cell is. So it's a nice visual way of just peeking through going, well, that's Python, that's Python, that's Python. Oh, it's all Python, it's fine. Um, that's all that changes. A little nice bit in the UI to kind of help us understand what's going on in each of those different cells. Okay, you can now create a cluster policy by cloning an existing policy. So cluster policies, we've not really talked about on the video before. Um, but essentially, if we are, if we're allowing users to a lot of spinning up and working with their own clusters, we can set a set of rules going, you can create your own cluster, but it has to fall within this boundary. So you could say a maximum number of worker nodes. So yeah, you can create a cluster, but you're not allowed more than five worker nodes, 10 worker nodes, 20, whatever you're doing. Or you can say it has to have auto terminate. Or you can say they're allowed to do anything in this range, or it must match this regex naming convention for your cluster. You've got to have tags on if you create a cluster. Lots of interesting stuff we can do with policies, but you couldn't copy them. Real simple little thing. You can now clone an existing policy and then tweak it to match what you're trying to do. Nice, easy, makes a lot of sense. We should do a video on cluster policies soon, um, but that's really, really nice little thing. You can now rename and delete experiments inside MLflow. Again, just usability. So you had um, permissions that kind of, there'd be lots and lots of work in permissions and making that a little bit more mature, a little bit better in MLflow over previous uh, months releases. Now you can just go and tweak around with an existing experiment. You can go and edit it, you can rename it, you can delete it, you can have a play around. Not like too much there, but it's just free, uh, improving the flexibility and the usability of uh, MLflow for experimentation management. Okay, then we had the runtime 10. And we can see that insane kind of between November 4th and ne November 10th was the GA, so it's only six days in um, out in the world in beta before we went, yeah, GA, we can use it now, which is uh, crazy <laughs> in terms of the speed. And we'll take a look at the runtime uh, release notes in a second. So other things, we've got a new ODBC driver. 
So been if you've been having a play around with that ODBC drivers, you can go and poke SQL uh, queries into Databricks. Um, previously, it wasn't very good in terms of the error that would bubble up. So there's a new version that's going to propagate the SQL error back um, to the Databricks client. So you just get a little bit more information. Basically, the response is going to be better if things go wrong. So you can actually build a slightly more robust application around it. You can use it to do some more interesting stuff. And again, that can be then be plugged into anything else that's using that um, ODBC engine to go and connect to it. Again, useful little incremental updates. Useful to keep an eye on it if you've built something around it that's expecting a certain response. That response may now be different. Be very, very aware of that as it comes in. Okay, so more similar things to the ML flow. We can now do things like we can clone uh, a job. We can play around with jobs. We can go and dig into a job and actually sort of see some more details when it's actually running. Essentially, just making it a little bit uh, more user friendly. The running job details is super interesting. We go and actually get a better idea of what's actually going on inside that. And we can see task details, some operational metrics, so a few things going on for that job while it's in runtime, uh, which is super, 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 super useful. So, yeah, interesting stuff. Um, you can never play around with it. Mentioned, I think, in one of the last ones, there was a new form of SQL widgets that came out. Uh, just essentially a nicer syntax and new way of uh, actually writing them. The old uh, widgets are not going to be supported uh, as of January 15th. So I mentioned at the time when I was talking about it and having a look at them, I'd never really used SQL widgets. Almost everything that we do, if we're doing it in a dynamic parameterized way. That's going to be PySpark. It's not going to be SQL. Um, so it's kind of a oh, yeah, interesting way of working. If you are using a lot of SQL widgets, be very aware they're going to end support for it on Jan 15th. So... Be a little bit careful uh, about how you're integrating, how you're working on it. Uh, again, watch one of the previous news videos when we went into detail on SQL widgets themselves. And then finally, uh, this one actually I've not actually seen working in mine yet. So I think this is the one that's still currently being rolled out. So I might be on the later part of that. Hopefully I'll get that tomorrow. Um, but essentially as part of files and repos, again, that's our ability to have lots of different types of files inside our Databricks repo, then we've actually now got the ability to go and play around with Python files, text files, markdown, that kind of stuff. And essentially, they've made it a little bit better when we're working with it. So I can't show you it now, but I can tell you the kind of things we're expecting to see. So if I'm in repos and I dive into one of our repos and just grab a, uh, not markdown, well, even a markdown would probably work. Uh, I'm gonna dive in and just grab that kind of quick bit of, a little bit of Python that we have to play around with. Um, so the ability to like close up these things, so if you were in like a, another editor like VS Code and things, you've got your functions or you've got a big load of JSON, you would like click and just collapse and expand those kind of things. Uh, that's what's normally referred to as that code folding. It's a very fancy name for it. Um, but think about like little, little, little bits and pieces of autocomplete in terms of closing tags when, when you're creating tags, code folding, realizing you're in a thing and actually being able to nest it up and make it more readable. Just basically making it a better text editor for when you're working with arbitrary files inside a repo. So definitely, definitely useful. Um, that other one actually being able to dig into files, that whole being able to dig into, I don't just want the relative path, which will kind of then give me, I'll show you what that gives me, gives me that local path inside my repo. But actually so the new thing they're doing, if I wanted to refer to the file in the repo, from another repo, from an actual deployed workbook, from a job, then I'd have to figure out what that whole address is with my repo structure and slash. Uh, and that's the other change is you're also going to be able to go, oh no, just don't just copy my relative path, give me my full path to this entire thing. Uh, and again, that's not rolled out on mine yet, but again, you should be seeing it over the next couple of days if you don't see it already. Cool, that's it. Fairly, fairly short list of stuff happening on the platform. But uh, a few interesting things, a few nice teas, a little bit of kind of, you know, again, like kind of nice user experience stuff coming out. Now, let's take a switch over onto the runtime itself and have a look what's new in Databricks Runtime 10. So firstly, Parquet is now a bit better. That's that's good. So when you're inside a Parquet file, Parquet is a columnar based um, file format. Uh, and it has these things called row groups. So you can go and see all well, how many chunks how many different collections of things do they go and read when I was inside that parquet file? So not just, yeah, I read one parquet file, but actually what do they do inside there? What's the total number of chunks of compressed columnar data did I actually go and have to access? Um, so essentially kind of across each of those row groups as it splits up that parquet file, getting that deeper understanding of the metrics inside there, super useful. 
uh, just improving how we can deal with straight parquet when we're looking at it inside this park UI just quite nice but this is the interesting one so a lot of people um certainly we use it a hell of a lot uh use a thing called trigger once when doing streaming now trigger once is always saying i don't want my streaming query to just run forever and keep my cluster turned on that's going to cost me a lot of money i just want you to run look at the checkpoint work out what i processed and what i haven't process anything i haven't processed yet and then complete complete the job and that's what trigger once did but people have scalability problems with that what if everything that came in since you last actually executed is way more than we want to fit inside a single micro batch so i'm just gonna scribble this out so if we say i have a delta table i've got a delta source it's got tons and tons and tons of transactions in there and i'm trying to write it to another delta table as part of a streaming job now if i've already read let's say i've read over here already let's say these are these are good I've read those two transactions, but it's been a busy old day. And there's been a load, a load of transactions that have come in since then that have yet to be processed. So if I'm using a traditional trigger once, if I say, well, kick off that job, go and run, and I'll go, okay, so trigger once, I'm going to refer to my checkpoint. So I've got a checkpoint sitting under my table. It refers to that, and it knows it needs to process all of that. And it'll do it as a single micro batch. And that might be hundreds of millions of rows. It'll try and do it as a single transaction. We'll go right okay i'm gonna stream all of this um and that could be really really super inefficient so what this new thing is saying is i still want to stop once i've caught up once i've read everything here and i get to the top and there's no more rows i don't want it to sit waiting and then spinning and constantly doing micro batches until something new comes i want it to catch up and then stop and what it'll do is actually now it'll still work out that same thing Except it'll, it'll break it up into micro batches. So it'll use the same rules of going, don't, don't bring in more than 10,000 rows at once. Don't bring in more than so many meg, gig, whatever your sizing is at once. And actually break those into chunks. But once it actually reaches the checkpoint point that it stopped, that kicked off at the start of that query, it'll then stop. And so it works the same way as trigger once. It's just it's saying trigger once, but do it in some micro batches if that's going to be more efficient all the changes but it just like really nicely changes some of those patterns certainly when we're using autoloader when we're using delta streaming there's lots of patterns where we might be doing a daily overnight incremental etl like the the traditional etl window at night and we'd still kick that off using delta streaming using autoloader and we'd use trigger once so we don't have to keep track of what we have and haven't loaded already and this means that can just be a hell of a lot more efficient and just go and run it in several different chunks. It's not going to try and do what things as one massive transaction. So yeah, super nice, really nice little easy option. So if you're doing a lot of autoloader, you're doing a lot of Delta streaming and you're using that, only run when I tell you to run, whether it's every hour, every couple of hours, every day, every couple of days, and you're using that trigger once, you can now do this trigger that's available now. Uh, how many files it should fit into side each triggering of that and then that'll break into those micro patches and it'll just work a little bit more efficiently for you you might not need to do that you might be perfectly happy the way it's currently working with trigger once and it goes in that single micro batch it's just a new option you have available so you can now go and do it so super super interesting delta autoloader both are in there both are potential candidates where that can make life a hell of a lot easier okay we've got another change so the way we connect to a lake, the blob storage, to wherever we're getting data from. Uh, traditionally, we do it in two options. So we either mount the whole thing, and that has some limitations in that anyone who uses the Databricks workspace gets the same access to that mount point. That might not be what we want. Or we connect in code. And so we, we create a session scoped. Is all the config for trying to access this particular blob store, this particular data lake store. And then we just use it for the rest of our notebook and it'll automatically know that it's using that same amount. This is another option that we're actually getting uh, to say, actually, I want to do it as an option inside my data frame. So rather than doing it as a separate job, I just want to give you my account key as an option I'm pushing in at runtime. Here's how to go and connect. And it just kind of just squeezes things down a little more. So that's what that's talking about. It's saying, well, actually, it's now an extra option we can pass into a data frame to give it the connection contact it needs for that particular query. It's like a lower level granular, a granularity. So rather than saying, 
here's the thing for the rest of the session. It's here's the thing for this command. This command, this command, this is the connection context to use, exposing some of those um Hadoop connection things inside our data frame. Again, interesting. I don't know how useful. Seems fairly niche, uh, but certainly has applications. Okay, we've got asynchronous state checkpointing now supported in stateful streaming. So a lot of the time when you're talking about streaming jobs that are constantly running, it's constantly going. Essentially, when it finishes a micro batch, it writes out all the checkpointing details. So there's like an extra little bit of work it does at the end of each one of those saying, right, okay, let me just write down what I've done. Okay, I've made my checkpoint. Now what's the next micro batch? So this change is saying, well, actually, why don't we just make it faster? So it'll already start the next micro batch and it'll be processing records and then separate and split out the job to go and write down that checkpoint. It no longer waits until that write of the checkpoint's finished before it starts the next bit of work. So it means it's having to keep in memory a little bit more information about what the checkpoint is and where it got to and all that kind of stuff. But that's absolutely, I mean, we're talking about small amounts of metadata for that. And it will just generally speed up the micro batches. Um, again, if you're doing the things that we did earlier, that available now kind of stuff doesn't really, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference if you're just doing one big chunky thing and you happen to be using streaming to do it. But if you're doing things that are real um, latency driven, you're trying to do some actual real-time streaming. You're trying to squeeze that window of how long it's taking between each of the updates to be as slim as possible. And actually, this should be a massive, massive help for you. I've not had a play with that yet. And again, it is in public preview. So you do your own risk, but certainly interesting for some of things that are going fast. Okay, Spock VR with credential pass-through. So if you are an R user and you've been trying to do that, you've not been able to do use AD pass-through in the past. Uh, so now you can do that. Again, big old limitation. Uh, it's limited to standard clusters with single user access, which for me is kind of a, it's a point in AD pass-through if we have to limit it to a single user. Might as well just hell hit the store block uh, the uh, service principle to use. It seems a little, little interesting, uh, but certainly it is plug in a little gap. So anyone who has been using Sparkly, uh, Sparkly R and they've been finding they can't quite use the thing the way it's been set up for other users of that same ecosystem then at least they can now hop on and use kind of uh, any engineering clusters that have been set up in single user mode, all that kind of stuff. And the final of the new features is we've seen that kind of uh, dbutils summarize command. It's a new command that gives you kind of a, a rich detailed um, view, description, summary um, of a particular data set. So you can say, well, here's a data frame, run summarize on it, tell me what is contained within there and it does all things like, as it says, distinct counts, percentiles, frequent item counts, basically does deep data profiling on that particular data set for you. Now, precision, you've now got how precise do you want it to be? So essentially kind of the summarize command came out a little while ago, and you've now got the option to say, should it be approximate? Should it just, just like a quick one? Cause I want the results quickly, or should it actually do a detailed proper scan and give me the real results? Um, so certainly if you're trying to do a summary on several billion rows, you probably wouldn't want to run a full massive summarize on that on a fairly small cluster. Or you might need to just have to wait a little while for it to go and finish. Um, whereas now we've got that option, true or false, should it be precise or should it use approximate values? And it'll go and perform quicker, perform slower, but more detailed. It's up to you. So that's all there is. A little bit of extra choice about how it works. And as usual, a big pile of bug fixes, library upgrades, all that kind of stuff. Always recommend going, having a look through a load of those ones just in case there are any libraries you rely on that have changed, any particular bugs that have been outstanding in Spark for a long time that have now been updated. And you can go and look in terms of the vanilla Spark uh, flavor. Loads of things in there. But as always, I say I advise you look through those yourself. Because again, you don't want me to read out a massive list of things. That works. Cool. All right. And that is us for today. So lots of interesting things. Certainly the available now uh, it's going to make a big change to some of the ways that we work, especially if we're doing fairly infrequent um, runs when we're using trigger once before. We've now got a lot more options uh, in terms of split, switching that available now on. Should just perform better churning through it, getting through all those changes. So 10.1, quite nice in terms of that new feature for both Autoloader and Delta. And then again, just lots of little bits and pieces of nice things, cloning things, copying settings from one place to another, not having to retype stuff is just always... Nice. So not a massive, massive game changing. Oh my God, there's a whole new area of data books, but lots of nice little things and some tweaks and some extra settings you can now use to be more efficient, perform a little bit better and just make things generally faster, which is 
the plan for everything really that is me for today as i said i will leave the notes for that release down in the description below and as always any questions anything you want to know feel free to say hello down below in the comments and as always don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already until next time i'll catch you later cheers